Hey guys, Naz here. Today I'm going to be showing you how I made this Princess Celestia plushie. She was really complicated to make with a lot of elements, so let's get started and hopefully I can cover as much as possible. So when I approach making a new plush, I like to go and look back at uh, that plush if I've made it previously and see where I could improve. This is the Celestia that I made in 2014. I'd made a couple of princess ponies before I made her, so I had a little bit more experience under my belt. Um, I still really like this plush, and don't take this as me um, sort of slandering um, this plush because I still think she's really beautiful. Uh, but there are definite things that I can see that need to be improved that I addressed when I made the new Celestia. So we'll have a little look at uh, how I made this one here quickly and what I changed in the current version. Uh, so I completely redid the pattern um, in almost every aspect. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can tell a difference. The head is certainly quite different. Um, the body uh, is definitely leaner. She has slightly longer and thinner legs. Um, back then I wasn't using as heavy a gauge wire as I use now in my alicorn legs. So she has a little bit of drooping going on um, that, that is fixed when you add stronger wire to help um, because these wings, body, mane and tail add such a massive stress on these legs. Uh, another thing I wanted to change was uh, to make her cutie mark in some slightly lighter colours. These were just the oranges and yellows that I happened to have on hand at the time, but I did prefer to go with a more accurate pale orange and pale yellow for her cutie mark in the current version. I changed her hairstyle completely, that was just personal preference. I wanted to have uh, it all be more of a single piece rather than blatantly obvious uh, forelock pieces and uh, then a large back piece. Uh, the tail is the exact same pattern, uh, I just obviously used printed Minky instead and I also had to make the main tail slightly smaller. The only reason I ended up doing that was because I had to take uh, Celestia with me in my baggage, otherwise I probably would have made both her and her mane and tail a fair bit larger. Uh, I quite like the wings but these open wings are a massive pain to make so I decided to uh, try something a little bit different and go with half folded wings. I also went with a gold outline for her shoes instead of the pink. The pink is more uh, show accurate but I decided to go with a more stylized fake metal look for all her regalia that she's wearing here. So apart from that, uh, you can see that her mane and tail are airbrushed with gradients and using standard minky colours, whereas the new one I used uh, printed spoonflower minky, which allowed me to not have these little seams visible between each colour and I was also more closely able to match the colours from the show. Because so much time has passed since I made my last Celestia pattern, I decided to make her from scratch again because I use so many different techniques now. So you can see here, I did about four tests for her body, each of them a fully patterned, sewn and stuffed. After finishing each of them, I take a photo, bring that into Photoshop and overlay vectors of Princess Celestia and that way I can see what needs changing. A lot of the time it's just subtle changes but this was a fairly straightforward change because I have made Celestia and many other patterns like hers in the past. You can see slight differences from the front here, but generally not much change from the front view, more uh, from the side. But this took maybe a week or so of patterning, probably eight hour days and a week's work to get that finalised body pattern that I felt was really accurate. The next step was patterning out where her cutie mark would be and what scale it would be. I printed out a number of sun cutie marks at different sizes and I used uh, an overlay in Photoshop to work out exactly which one was the correct size. I then placed this image on top of the test plush and I draw where I want it to be placed. I then totally unpick that area of the plush giving me a flat piece as it would be as a pattern and this shows me exactly where my embroidery needs to be. I scan this into Photoshop and I put the vector image onto my pattern and use this to find out exactly where the placement needs to be. I cut out, I print out my pattern and then I cut out the fabric 
just a bit larger than it needs to be so that I can do the embroidery and then cut afterwards. It's much easier to do this because you have a lot more control of the position of your embroidery. So now I'm bringing the scaled kitty mark into my embroidery program. I use the Benina Embroidery Suite version 6 and pretty much I'm just doing the equivalent of vector tracing in the program, tracing over each of the shapes and then dictating where, uh, what colour I want each shape to be, removing overlaps, tweaking shapes, tweaking stitch types, etc. I then bring this into my machine and choose which hoop that I want to use. I used one of my smaller hoops because the cutie mark is not that large. Even though Celestia is quite a large plush, her cutie mark is quite small because her body is so slender. I set up my embroidery hoop. I use floating embroidery, so instead of hooping my fabric, I hoop my stabiliser, use spray adhesive and then stick the fabric on the top. This prevents stretching or warping with the minky. After that, I put some tearaway stabiliser on top. This will make sure that the minky fibres don't get stuck in the embroidery. I load up my appropriately coloured threads and I start the process of uh, stitching out the embroidery for her cutie mark. I think this file took about 15 minutes all up, uh, that doesn't include the time it took to change threads. But you can see here I'm just doing a regular fill stitch which is just a standard stitch for the outside of her flames. Uh, I then proceed to stitch the interior of the circle in a pale yellow and then I finalise all that embroidery by doing some lovely satin stitching around the circle, the, the outer sort of golden circle around, her, uh, around the middle of the sun. You want to make sure to only use this type of satin stitch in small areas. You don't want to make it very wide because it is more of a fragile stitch. I would definitely go ahead and put some fray stop or some sort of product to stop that satin stitching from potentially being scratched or damaged because it is that little bit more fragile. The little smudge you can see in the centre is just a heat removable marker that I used to work out my embroidery placement but that will be removed later. I did end up redoing that embroidery twice uh, for both kitty marks just because the first ones that I did had some very slight errors and I wanted to make them absolutely perfect for the final plush because so much work was going to go into her. The next step is once you finish your embroidery to cut it away from the hoop, remove all the excess stabiliser from the back and then I'm flipping the fabric over, taking my pattern piece and placing the cue mark exactly where it's meant to be. Uh, as you can see I've drawn here on the pattern where the sun is and cut, cut a little window so I can see through exactly where I want to place it. I then use a heat removable marker to trace the rest of my pattern so that the sun is in the exact spot. It's much easier to trace your pattern after you've done the embroidery with this wriggle room that I've left around the embroidery rather than trying to have your pattern piece already traced and cut and then get the embroidery to fit exactly in that spot. Uh, you can see here that I've put a bunch of marks up and down the pattern pieces and these are just registration marks that are going to be used when I sew the plush up later on. Because she is such a large plush these registration marks really help to make sure that everything lines up properly and that nothing is being skewed one way or another which can result in uh, slanting or, or warping in different areas of the plush. So here I'm just going ahead and tracing the rest of my pattern pieces including all those little markings that are necessary. And this uh, heat removable marker is really handy, especially when working on such light fabric, because if any of the marker is showing through on the final plush, you can just go ahead and get a hairdryer or an iron and just lightly tap on the marker and you'll never see it again. So I'm going to go ahead and cut all my pieces out. And with Minky, you have to shake them out over preferably a bin or something like that because you get little fuzzies everywhere. You can see them sort of accumulating on the table here and soon they'll be accumulating on my clothing as well. Uh, but once you've shaken these all out, you're ready to start pinning and sewing the plush together. I'm really pedantic about how much pins I put on a lot of my plushies. I probably do too much, but it's better to be safe than sorry in my opinion. I'd rather go way overboard and not have any errors than use too few pins and then have to restitch a couple of times. To do my pinning, I put a pin at the top of the pattern piece and the bottom of the pattern piece, lining both of them up. 
and then I go ahead and put them at each of the registration marks then stretching the fabric appropriately to go between those pins I've already put and repeat <coughs> repeat that process until it's thoroughly pinned. I also flip the pieces over and pin on the opposite side so that it doesn't end up curling under itself. So you can see just how many pins I've used here. This is an extremely fast motion, it doesn't get, doesn't get sewn that quickly. I choose to sew over my pins because it's more accurate and I feel confident in doing so, but it is uh, a bit of a risk that you take when sewing over them because they can potentially snap and could damage your machine or hurt yourself so do so at your own risk. Uh, I have a lot of experience and know how to try and avoid this sort of thing so that's just what I choose to do. A lot of these seams I ended up double stitching just to reinforce them and make them nice and sturdy. I didn't want any seams popping with all that pressure that is going to be exerted on them with the stuffing. Once the entire pattern's sewn, I then take a pair of long tweezers and I try and gently turn the plush inside out. You want to be careful to not push too hard, especially when pushing lots of fabric through these tiny little areas like the top of her legs. So just gently pushing everything through and eventually you'll get her turned inside out. It took me around four hours or so to sew the body together. Most of that time goes into the excessive amount of pins that I use, but I was really happy with the final result. I chose not to show you guys the entire uh, sewing process because that probably would show you guys too much of the pattern and I don't really want to give this pattern away. Uh, you can see now that I'm moving on to the internal support that goes inside the plush. I personally like to have flat hooves, which is just something that came, uh, came to be sort of in style among pony plushies in the earlier days and I've still continued to do it. I like the really clean look of the flat hoof and to achieve this all I do is trace my hoof pattern onto some hard plastic. This comes in a roll I get it at my local hardware store I believe it's used for uh, roofing or something like that but it's kind of just a, a, a flexible but still relatively solid little uh, plastic sort of like a thin acrylic I then feed this into the bottom of her legs, which is quite tricky because they're so long and thin. So you did see that I had to bend them over to get them to the bottom of the hooves. I then flatten them out on the bottom of the hooves and then I proceed to put the uh, weighting into the bottom of the hooves as well. Here I'm using a product called Poly Pellets. They're used in doll making a lot of the time and they're just a weighted plastic pellet. And I like to put these in the bottom of all my ponies' hooves because it just gives them a lot more rigidity and weight so that they don't sort of flail around. It gives them a much more solid stance and helps them to stand up, especially with all that weight on the top that's sort of encouraging the legs to move around and bend. The next step is going to be getting this stuffing ready. So stuffing is probably my most hated portion of making an alicorn plush. A lot of stuffing goes into them and you have to put in only very small amounts at a time, otherwise you're going to get very lumpy results. So you can see here, uh, this is extremely sped up. I'm just preparing all the stuffing that I'm going to be using for her body. I grab big handfuls and then tease them into small pieces that are appropriate for the process. So with Celestia, unfortunately, I had a lot of trouble with stuffing her um, because of the nature of her, her body shape. She's extremely long and slender and that makes it very difficult to stuff um, because you have very little access to get to the bottom of those legs. I had little incisions made in the back of all of her legs so that I could get the stuffing in that way. It would be pretty much impossible to get all the stuffing through her neck so I had to go in through the top of those legs and it's barely noticeable on the final plush, you'd only really notice it if you were specifically looking for it. This takes several hours, I would say stuffing this plush probably took um, literally probably six or seven hours and unfortunately because I was really picky and because this is such a difficult process I redid this four times so I, I was really over it by the time I'd finished this was the first time that I attempted to do it and I just put on some you know some shows in the background a movie in the background and just uh, went to town trying to get this job done as I'm stuffing, I'm using some long pincers to push it all the way down to the bottom of the leg. And I'm also using my hands to sort of 
uh, squish it around and try to make it look as smooth as possible. There's a bunch of different techniques you can use to try and make it smooth. You can also use a large pin, which you might see me doing here and there, to drag stuffing from the outside and just push it around the inside of the plush. But eventually I got a, a final job that I was reasonably happy with. I would like to work on some different techniques in the future, but Celestia just has such extreme anatomy that I could only make the best of a very difficult situation. And props to anyone who knows what I'm watching in the background. Uh, but I did watch, watch a lot of shows while I was doing this because it's a very boring and very... Um, very painful on your hands because you're just pushing pushing very hard on these forceps over and over for several hours so I tended to end up with blisters every single time I was doing this. The next step in this process is to wire the legs. I choose to wire my Alicon's legs because with the extreme anatomy that they do have and that I make them with there's no way that they would be able to support themselves the weight of their body, wings, mane, tail, head, horn, all that sort of thing with those long skinny legs unless there's some sort of solid material inside them. I usually pad my wire to make it a bit softer but unfortunately with them having such tiny tiny little openings at the top of their legs there's no way for me to fit it in so I do have to use raw wire when wiring these particular alicorns with these extremely skinny legs. Once all that wiring is done, they'll be able to support their weight and their legs will keep their shape for a very long time. I make my alicorns and many of my plush for display pieces only, so I'm not really too worried about the wire taking away some cuddliness or that sort of element of the plush because they are just so big, bulky and really impossible to cuddle in the way that a conventional plush can be cuddled. They're really made more for display. The wire that I use is just stainless steel fencing wire that I buy at my local hardware store and I use a fairly heavy gauge so it's got a lot of strength in it. After I finished the body I moved on to patterning the head. You can see how many attempts it took me to pattern the head here, I tried a couple of different methods. Typically for a simple head like this it takes me about five, or three to five goes depending on how lucky I get. You can see here that I got pretty close by number four and then by number five I was pretty happy with how I was going and I was ready to move on to the embroidery placement. I just did this the same way as I did the uh, her cutie mark. I drew her eyes and then I drew it onto the pattern. I unstuffed the head and I scanned the pieces so that I knew exactly where I needed to do my embroidery. I had to embroider her eyes actually probably about five or six times. Each of those sets of eyes probably takes about half an hour with all the colour changes and such. This was a huge pain. A lot of the time it was just due to machine error. I had my fabric um, get munched into the machine a couple of times just because there's so many layers to these eyes. But I did get how I wanted it in the end. You can see here that I've done most of the eye. I'm just going in and doing the black. I chose to leave the embroidered eyelashes to be glued on later because I just had my machine eat the fabric too many times trying to um, embroider over them which is the way that I usually attach them. I've gone ahead and done my gradient embroidery with various paints. Uh, I won't go into too many details because it's a little bit of a trade secret that I'd like to keep for myself, but I'm sure that you can work out how to do some nice gradients if you have a think about it and do some practicing with various paints. Here I'm going in and embroidering her eyelashes and eyelid. I'm using a lovely satin stitch here which is another really good application for this type of stitch because you are doing such thin areas and it really gives a lot more volume to the stitch. These are a pair of eyes that I ended up not using. I was going to give Celestia sort of squee happy eyes, those with the, with the raised lower eyelid, but I decided that I preferred just a standard eye but keeping that sort of excited smile that she gets on a very rare occasion. Here I'm stuffing the head that I didn't end up using. I didn't really hate these eyes, they just weren't exactly what I wanted, but it did give me a chance to tweak her embroidery files to make it perfect and I was really happy with the final result. Here you can see how the final head turned out. I've glued on her 3D eyelashes, which are a black foam, and I've also made her 3D ears, which are also something that I don't really like to make tutorials on because I think that they're just a unique element that adds to my plushies. 
So I was really happy with this head and now that both her head and body were done all I needed to do was attach them together and then I could move on to her mane and tail. So to attach her head to her body I pin it in place using several pins making sure that it is all aligned correctly, trying to make sure that there's not too much of a slant to the head and that it's not rotated in a bad way. You can see that I pull a lot of funny faces when I'm concentrating on doing hand stitching um, but I did go around her head I think two or three times. I didn't film the entire thing because it just goes on forever. So you can see I'm just doing a simple ladder stitch. There are plenty of YouTube tutorials on how to do a ladder stitch. It's very important to learn how to do this when you're plush making. It's an awesome stitch because you really can't see the stitches from the outside and it closes up all your gaps and is a very strong stitch to sew one element of a plushie to another. So that's how I connected her head and now that that was all done I just finish off that piece of thread by doing a knot in the back of her neck and pulling it through so you can't see it anymore. Instead of manually sewing every single colour and gradient in her hair, in her mane and tail, I decided to order from Spoonflower this time around. Spoonflower is a, is a website that you can order printed fabric from and they do do printed minky. Uh, this was my first time using them so I digitised all my pattern pieces and I essentially vectored them in Photoshop using the, the shape tool, the pen shape tool, and I applied gradients over the top of all of them to get uh, the exact match for Princess Celestia's mane and tail. Not only does this save me days if not weeks of sewing all those curves together but I could get those gradients that weren't really possible to get as refined as possible. I could also um, get all the colours matched as perfectly as I could. With Minky there are only a limited amount of colours. I think there's something like a hundred and so, so colours but it really isn't as much as it sounds because you can't match those exact blues, those exact greens, those exact pinks, you can only get approximations. So here's what all my shapes looked like laid on top of the pattern. You can see that this is a very large document, um, a very large file. It's the size of the pieces of fabric that you can print. This is a one yard of printed spoon flower fabric. So I went ahead and I ordered that fabric from Spoonflower with a rush service to get it sent to me as soon as possible because it had to be sent all the way to Australia. I think this fabric would cost something like, I think it was about 22 US dollars a yard, um, give or take, I can't remember exactly, but I definitely think that it's worth it for the amount of time that it saves you and you can get some really cool effects that you couldn't get with conventional sewing, airbrushing, dyeing, etc. And you can really match those colours perfectly. You can see here how my first order came out. I also ordered the main tail and wing fabric for Princess Cadence. Unfortunately, I tried to match the colours as close as possible for Princess Celestia but I was really unhappy with how the green came out. That was the only colour that I didn't like how it came out. Unfortunately that meant because I'm really picky and because I put so much time and money into this plush I wanted to reorder Tia's fabric again just so that it was the perfect shade of green. The green is what frames her face and I felt like it would really detract if it was the wrong shade. This green here is a bit too saturated for my liking. Her her green in her mane and tail is a bit more of a bluish green. So I worked on Princess Cadence and I sent off for the second round of fabric and you can see what it looks like here. It's a much more subdued green and I was extremely happy with it. I thought it was leaps and bounds ahead of the previous green that I ordered. The difference between normal minky and spoonflower minky is that the nap or the length of the fur, the little fur pieces, is a bit shorter so it's a bit smoother and also on darker pieces you have to watch out that you can't see the white from underneath because it does not print all the way to the back of the fabric. Here you can see I went on a crazy pinning spree again just because this fabric is a little bit more slippery than normal minky and I didn't want to mess up when sewing it. This is sped up incredibly fast. It really did take a long time to sew all the curves on this mane and tail because her mane and tail are just, are just wiggles everywhere which are quite difficult to sew because you do have to stop, pivot, stop, pivot, stop, pivot uh, and you can't just sew a long straight line. It's very fiddly. You can see here again I'm sewing over my pins at my own risk but I found that that gives me a lot of control and it makes sure that that fabric isn't slipping where I don't want it to go. 
after I've sewn that entire tail twice just to make sure that it's extra strong and none of the seams are going to rip because she is a very giant plush I'm going to remove all those pins and what I did was I turned it inside out and I checked that there weren't any gaps in the seams I actually found a couple of gaps so I, I used that chance to turn it back the wrong way um, with the inside on the outside and I reinforced those seams where they might, I might have missed just a tiny bit. I did have some errors in my Spoonflower printing which was probably due to me being a newbie with using it, I hadn't used it before. There were some scaling issues so I didn't have as large a seam allowance which is the area outside of where you stitch um, because I had to work with some slight scaling issues. Once I checked that all those seams were good from both the inside and outside, I clip away all that excess minky. It's easier to just do this than clipping tiny little curves and, and notches in it, which is what is usually recommended. I usually just get rid of all the excess and that makes sure that when you turn it inside out, all your curves are lovely and can curve the way that they want to without that fabric, excess fabric, bunching up on the inside. So I went and stuffed this mane and tail like I would normally, nothing too exciting, the same as I did with the process before with all the little pieces. And you can see how the printed minky came out. I was extremely happy with it. One downside of the printed minky is uh, in your darker areas and especially on your seams, you're going to have the fabric pinched into the seams and that is going to show the white base of the printed minky. This is really easy to fix. All I did was get my trusty cat hair brush, and this has never been used for cats, but that's ex um, that is what it's used or intended for. So I use this one exclusively for plushies, and I use it to brush the hair out of the seams. So it's like using a bunch of little blunt needles just to drag all the fur out of those seams, and that really makes a huge difference with this printed minky, so you can't see all those white bits popping out of the seams anymore. I then take a clean brush and I just brush all the minky down. The minky flows in one direction, so I just brushed it downwards so that it wasn't sort of unruly and poking anywhere it shouldn't. Here's how the tail looks. It's resting on some wire that runs through Celestia's back up into her head and this is done because her tail is so extremely heavy that it would drag the rest of the plushie down if it didn't have wire supporting its weight. I obviously haven't attached it yet because it still has more work to be done on it. I went ahead and sewed her mane as well. I was extremely happy with how this printed Minky came out. There was no way I could have got these exact colour matches or these particular gradients if I hadn't used printed Minky. And it was also much, much faster to do all that sewing uh, compared to if I was sewing each of the individual colours together. So the next step was to add these beauties. I was really excited. This is one of my favourite parts, is just sitting there adding sparkly bits all over the mane and tail, which I got to do in, in great amounts with Celestia because she has so many sparkles on her. I bought these from an Australian Diamonte supplier. They come in various colours and qualities, uh, but I decided to buy a different colour for each colour of her mane and tail. I ended up adding a blue to the mix that I didn't show in this video. But I just got really excited because they're so beautiful. I'm not sure if you can really tell the difference in the colours now that they are on the plush, but I guess I just had a lot of fun working with so many different colours and different sparkly uh, diamantes. Each of these little gems has a flat back with glue on it and to attach them onto the mane and tail I use this new little tool that I got which is a hot fix tool. It has a little tip on the end that you can use to pick up the gems and while you're holding them in there it heats the back of them and then you can press them onto your fabric and that that hot melted glue will instantly bind onto whatever you press it onto. It's kind of like using a soldering iron it's very got an extremely hot tip and you don't really want to touch that or any of the gems when you just put them on because they are absolutely scorching hot but it does do a really good job of attaching them I used to use uh, my iron to iron on all these little diamantes and I had to do that while the fabric was still flat but ironing can damage minky if you do it too much 
and it's just much much easier to use this little tool. This one was only really cheap, I bought it from the store that sells the Diamantes. It was something like 15 or 20 dollars but the amount of time that it saved me made it worth way way more than that. I'll probably invest in a better quality one in the future as you can see this one's just plastic and cheap but it did the job and it got all these Diamantes on with relative ease. So I just put on some music or movies in the background and went to town with adding all these sparkly diamantes. It was lots and lots of fun. So you can see here how it looks now that it's all finished. It really looks the best when she's under a very bright direct light because that makes them sparkle just that little bit extra. Under this sort of uh, natural soft light they don't glitter as much but you can get a general idea of how sparkly they are. You can see the blues, the pinks, the greens and the turquoise, all the different colours that I used throughout her mane and tail. So I was really happy with that and I repeated the process on her mane pieces and then her mane and tail was essentially finished. Here's what her mane looks like. I, as you can see up the top, I didn't really put any where her head would be blocking because it would just be sort of a waste. But I tried to make the spread look quite natural. Some of them I put fairly far apart, sometimes I put them in clusters. I think making it not too geometric and making it more of an organic spread just makes it look more appealing. If you made it sort of like a checker box or something, you'd really notice that pattern on the final plush. But I try and make it look more like some stars or something like that, which have a bit more of a random pattern. So you can see here how the main tail looks when it's put on her. This lighting's not fantastic for showing off their true colours. Uh, a lot of these Diamantes did get covered up unfortunately by her crown and horn, uh, but I wasn't too worried about that. So after this, I was ready to start on her regalia. So with her regalia, I have improved my patch making greatly. I didn't really know how to do it properly when I first made my very first Celestia, but I've since come across a really great way to make patches. And these are just done with minky fabric onto some wash away material that I hoop. And then I proceed to do some thick satin stitching around the edges. Once these are all finished, the excess on, of backing is removed with water and there's various things that I do during the digitising process to make sure that these patches are nice and rigid and I just find that that's a really neat way of making her regalia, especially these shoes here because you can get that lovely thick satin, uh, satin stitching type outline and as and it saves a lot of time rather than sewing them manually onto the flat plushy pieces. Unfortunately I had to do this uh, three times and it probably takes about six hours between digitising, um, getting all your materials ready, stitching all of these out. This is sped up 15 times so it takes a really long time to do each of these little shoes but I was really happy with the results so I persevered. Uh, the first ones I am going to show you how I airbrushed. I wanted to do a fake gold kind of effect so I pinned all of them down, I mixed up a golden sort of colour and I went to town airbrushing just some general sort of golden stripes um, of various gradients on there, drying each layer in between. I actually messed up this this set of shoes because I got a bit too excited with the gold and I just kept going and going and while it looked fantastic it was way too dark a gold for Princess Celestia. Her shoes in the show are quite a pale gold and as much as I loved how awesome and poppy these looked they're just too dark. They're more of a, a dark gold almost going into sort of coppery colours. Uh, so unfortunately I had to scrap these which was a bit of a heartbreaker. I then went on to do the second lot which I intended to do with much paler airbrushing and I realised that I used the wrong thread colour after I had completely finished them. You can see them in a second when we switch to the next clip. Um, here I'm just patterning her horn, nothing too interesting, just making sure the scale is right before I do the embroidery. But here's the next set of shoes that I did. You can see the airbrushing is paler, but I accidentally used too dark of a gold thread for the outline. And that really bugged me because it really detracted from the rest of the plush because there was this very dark outline against all these pastel colours. 
I went on and I did her horn. I digitized the lines in my embroidery software and stitched them out, which is relatively simple. The first lot that I did, as you can see here, I felt the lines were too thin. So I did it a second time, making slightly thicker lines. And I was really happy with the horn, which is just a really simple pattern. You're just tracing a horn, doing two pieces, um, sewing them together and match up, matching up those lines from the top to the bottom. So here are the slightly thicker lines that I used. I used pink to match her, her vector images and that was relatively simple. But I did have that pressing issue of needing to redo those shoes all over again, which I was not looking forward to. But I'm really glad that I did in the end because uh, the final result really shows the difference between these dark outlines and the pale outlines. The next step was patterning her necklace and her crown. The crown was simple, I just found a vector image of her crown, printed it out and made sure it was to scale. The, the necklace, I simply printed out uh, some profile sketches of the crown and all I do is cut, add, paste, you know, using sticky tape until I find the exact shape that I would like. Then I go ahead and I cut those pieces away from each other so that it is just a flat piece and I bring them into my embroidery software and I, here I'm just digitizing all those little golden details that are on her necklace. I'm just doing satin stitching for each of these little curls and I've also done a straight stitch that goes all the way around the pattern piece for the necklace. So the necklace is essentially four pieces of that top shape. Um, they're just sewn together so the middle pieces are sewn um, for two sets and then both front and back are sewn together with a bit of quilt batting which is more of a solid material in between just so that it has some rigidity to it. So after that was done I airbrushed it to match the shoes and here I'm going to start patterning her wings. So when I'm patterning things like wings or things that I need to find an exact scale for compared to the rest of the plush, I like to take a photo of the plush with a ruler against it and then I can bring this into Photoshop and then I can overlay an image of Celestia and then use that to measure exactly how long I want the wings to be. That was relatively simple so I printed out the wings to the scale that I used um, those measurements for and I just put them against her and made sure that they looked right. And I was very happy, I didn't want to make them too big or too small and I thought that this size was just right. Here I am stitching out the patch for her crown. This is the second time I did this. The first time I stitched it out and it looked lovely but the only thing that I felt that I'd done wrong was I made the outline too thin. In the show, the outline for all the pieces, her, her body, her mane, her tail, her crown, all those sort of things, they're all the same width. And I made the width for the outer line on the crown too thin compared to, say, the line I'd used on her shoes. So I ended up redoing this and doing a thicker outline, which makes it more sturdy anyway. I then went ahead and stitched out the gems. Uh, the gem on her crown as well as two freestanding gems that I was going to use on her necklace. I did two because just in case one messed up I would have a backup. I, in this case both of them turned out quite well and I ended up just picking the one that looked neater and using that one. But if I have space in my hoop I like to just do that extra one just in case. So I chose not to do 3D gems for her, uh, for her regalia this time. I did do them last time, but I thought that this was a bit cleaner looking. I still haven't found a way to make gems that I'm 100% happy with. I know you can make them out of resin and that's what I did last time, but I think I'm going to wait until I get a 3D printer and I can 3D print um, really accurate 3D gems instead of trying to sculpt them by hand and then casting them, which came out not entirely perfect as you would want a gem to be. So here I'm just doing the final outline stitches on these uh, patch style gems and once that backing is removed, that water soluble backing is removed, I did do a little bit of touch up with paint here and there to make the gems perfect and then I glued them onto, onto her necklace. Now Celestia's giant wings are a huge pain to make because she has these extremely long feathers and so many of them. It takes forever to pin, sew, turn out, just everything. They're a huge pain. So instead of manually sewing each of the four wing pieces, 
I decided to sew them in the largest of the hoops that I have for my embroidery machine and this just makes sure that every single piece matches it's also much neater and faster and just a, a real benefit of having a very large hoop on your machine my machine here is a Benina 830 LE and that was bought second hand from a really good friend of mine and was an upgrade from my previous machine you can see here that I've done the embroidery on the base piece, which will be the front piece. I've now laid another piece of fabric on top of it, the, the right sides facing together. And I'm just stitching, repeatedly stitching that pattern piece for the lower part of her wing. I'm now adding some quilt batting, which is just a sort of solid fabric kind of material that goes in bags and quilts to make them more rigid. Here you can see the pieces before I've turned them inside out. Um, you can see that I've trimmed all the excess minky away from them and then I had to proceed to flip all those pieces inside out which was a huge pain uh, and then proceed to iron those. So you can see here that I've redone her shoes, I've airbrushed her crown and her necklace to match. I was extremely happy with the final result and that I bothered to redo those shoes. I just think that they blend in a lot more with her pastel colours and they don't detract like the previous set of shoes did. I'm really happy with the crown and the necklace as well. I would like to work out a more 3D necklace pattern in the future, but I was running low on time, so I just went with what uh, you can see here and I'm still very happy with it. So you can see that fake golden sort of look airbrushed onto all of the pieces. It's a bit more gold than yellow, which I wanted to stick to, to um, for Princess Celestia rather than going with a blaring yellow, try and make it look a little bit more natural. The crown is just pinned here, but I did end up adding magnets to it later so that it can be removed for travel because she is so tall, she only fits in my baggage without her um, unfortunately without her crown, horn or wings so she only fits in my bag as an earth pony. Uh, so after that I took my wing pieces, I ironed them flat and I ended up with this. So I just pinned the pieces together where I wanted them to be connected and here I am working out the placement of the wings. So I just hold them up to the body, I work out where I want them, I place a pin where I want the wire to come out of her body and I then cut some little holes where I want the wire to go through. I then put the wire in into her body and then um, through those little holes and this is that heavy duty wire that I mentioned earlier. Here you can see that I'm just bending it to match the shape of the wings. This took a fair while, this wire is extremely strong and I'm not very strong at bending it. So I just took it one little bit at a time, bending it to match that curve of the wing so that then I could place the, uh, the wire inside the wings and it would hold them up and they wouldn't have any problems with falling down. They are quite heavy so they definitely need the wire. I wire pretty much all of my open wings because they are so large and heavy and without that wire they'll just fall down and not really hold their beautiful shape. So I just make some tiny incisions in the wings to feed the wire through. You can see here is the lower piece and then I repeat the process with the upper piece and I align them so that uh, they're the shape that I want them to be. I then proceed to sew uh, the upper piece of the wing to the lower piece of the wing as well as sewing the base of the wing to the body and that's essentially how I made those half folded wings. It's pretty simple, just two pieces I scanned, um, I traced off vector images and then I sewed them out using my embroidery machine. You could do it manually but it was much faster to do it with the machine. Then finishing up by just running that wire through the wings and sewing all the pieces together. Here we have Tia all finished, out and ready to have her photo shoot done. I'm extremely happy with how she came out. I think she's gorgeous and I'm really happy to be able to keep her for my own personal collection. I so rarely get to make plushies for myself so um, just the fact that I'll be able to take her to this convention and get her signed by her voice actress, um, it just means a lot to me. So I hope you guys like her. Um, I've tried to cover as much as possible. I know this was a really long video um, but she was also a really complicated plushie to make so I hope you learnt something. If you have any burning questions that you want answered about her um, that I haven't answered on this video or in my Patreon feed, just send me uh, a message on one of my pages of social media or Patreon private message. But I'll leave you guys with a bit of a view of the finished plush. 
and I hope you enjoy. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.